it's from a place called Falafel, right down Woodward. It's pretty close, a good walk uh, during the spring. A bad walk during the winter, I guess. Um, but they also delivered. Uh, you should try it out. It's a newer restaurant. Uh, but if you go by your agenda, we're going to have Mr. Albert Bowman speak. Uh, and then Michelle. Uh, and then possibly also uh, Brett. And I'll give a little intros in a second. But thank you guys for all coming. And now... Albert, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Albert Brown. You, you guys probably all recognize him from your orientation. Uh, but he's a benefits rep from Total Compensation and Wellness Office. So thank you very much, Albert. It's all you. Thank, thank you, you, Dennis. Hello, everyone. How are you guys? Yeah. Right, I'm going to start off by mentioning something that you guys are probably anticipating. You guys know that open. Can you guys hear me in the back, by the way? Yeah. All right, good. All right, I got some hands up. <laughs> Open enrollment is going to start, it's going to be October 26th through November the 6th. So a lot of what I talk about with regards to like flexible spending, changing medical plans, can be done during that period. So I just wanted you guys to know that. Let me repeat that. It's going to be October 26th through November the 6th. That is your opportunity to sign up under something new, change a plan. It's considered our open enrollment period. Now I'm going to start off with flexible spending. This is something that a lot of people want to know more about, and not enough people, frankly, take advantage of it. A flexible spending account is attractive because, number one, it allows you to use uh, tax-free money to do uh, your, uh, it's uh, tax deferred for dependent care and medical care uh, expenses. The uh, flexible spending is not paired with your medical insurance. That means that certain things that may not be covered under your medical plan, for instance, acupuncture, would be covered under flexible spending. The attractive thing about flexible spending is you get to use this tax-deferred money for health care expenses to the sum of a maximum of $2,500, $2,550, excuse me, we just increased it uh, in 2015. And the maximum for the dependent care, the max that you can put in in a year is $5,000. Now, the difference between the two is the health care flexible spending would be for any medical-related, health-related expenses. That includes depending, uh, dental, it includes uh, medical expenses, co-pays, deductibles. Uh, it includes a lot of the uh, things that you want to go in for, like eyeglasses, hearing aids, and all those fun things that we typically buy. The dependent care it's for you to come to work and someone to watch your dependents. It's like a, it's for daycare, it's a latchkey, summer day camp, that kind of thing. Now you're probably wondering, okay, he explained it, what, what, how does it work? Well, your flexible spending account is something that you set up, you fill out the enrollment form, or you go online, because we do have that availability during our annual open enrollment period, and you actually indicate what you want for the year. We call it your annual pledge. So whatever amount that you want to contribute, you indicate that. It will tell you what it will be by weekly. Simply put, for those of you that are 12-month uh, employees, you're going to have 26 deductions. If you're a 9-month employee, you're going to have 20 deductions deducted from your paycheck. So in a sense, the big draw to this flexible spending account is this giving yourself a pay raise. I'll read something that I normally don't do, but I'm going to read this because I think this is really applicable. A flexible spending account allows you to set aside a portion of your salary before taxes to pay for qualified medical or dependent care expenses. Because that portion of your income is not taxed, you end up with more money in your purses, your wallets, you name it. So that's why it's probably something that you all might want to take advantage of you're going to be incurring these expenses anyway, so why not have a flexible spending account? By the way, the minimum that you can set up a healthcare flexible spending account for is $130. That's the least amount that you can put in, and you'll still have it. The minimum for the dependent care is $208. So I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that. Now you're probably wondering, okay, well, I think I might be interested, but how easy is it to use? I heard about the fact that a flexible spending account comes with a debit card, and you heard correctly. Um, actually, I have one in my wallet if you want to see it afterwards. It's like a credit card for those of you who don't have one. You swipe it and you go. Some of your expenses will be auto-substantiated. Simply put, you do not have to come up with documentation, verifications, uh, proving that your expense was a legitimate expense. That would include 
your known co-pays through your medical account at Wayne State University. It would include reoccurring expenses that you have that may not be the uh, the normal amount. Like let's say your your uh, flexible spending health care prescription is two dollars instead of the norm. The norm is five dollars. Uh, if it's a generic, if it's a brand name, it's either going to be a preferred or not preferred. Preferred is going to be $20, not preferred is going to be $45. Sometimes you get that irregular amount because your drugs are a little bit cheaper than the co-pays are. And that's a windfall for everyone. And uh, if it happens again and again, it's considered a reoccurring expense. So just be aware that that, too, would be auto-substantiated. There are some claims that are not auto-substantiated, meaning that you have to provide the proof, the documentation. And what that requires is the following. They want to know, and this is other than your copay amounts, they want you to wait typically for an EOB that makes the process a lot easier. An explanation of benefits is what that stands for. Every time you use your medical expense, there is a document that's generated. It's called an EOB or an explanation of benefits. It describes exactly what happened, your co-pays, where you went, what, had, what, what, what you had done. Anyway, in addition to that, uh, they're looking for receipts and statements, which includes your data service, your type of service, your provider name, and the dollar amount. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, how do you sign up again? Open enrollment is your only opportunity unless you were a new hire. I believe I spoke to one person in here who was brand new. Uh, within six days, he could sign up actually right away. His uh, coverage would go into effect. He's in the back there he is. His coverage would go into effect first in the month following his data hire. Can we ask questions? Absolutely. Okay, let's say I set it up for 250 and I only use 150 What happens with the remaining $100? Well, you do lose it if you eventually never get a chance to... I'm sorry. Can everyone hear the question? Oh, let me repeat the question then. She's wondering about what would happen if she set it up for $200, $250, but she didn't use it all. And I was going to tell her that either you use it or you lose it, but... To give you a little bit more of an um, opportunity to get it done, we give you a two-and-a-half-month extension. Now, normally, you will find that a flexible spending account starts, if, if you're doing a calendar year, it'll start in January, and it'll typically end in December, December 31st. That's the period of time that you would have to incur expenses. But at Wayne State, we're allowing employees to have an extra two-and-a-half months tacked on to that to incur expenses. So if you sign up for 2016, you can incur expenses from January 1st of 2016 through March 15th of 2017. So you have this extra time so you don't lose it, hopefully. And then, to help you out a little bit more, we give you to April 30th of 2017 to get your paperwork together, submit all your receipts, whatever you need to do, so you would be completely substantiated for those items that need substantiating. But remember, your period of incurring claims has been extended. Did I see a hand up over here? Yeah, my question was, how long is your debit card working for? Is, is the debit card only for the calendar year, or is the debit card working for I love that question. Let me repeat that for those of you who may have not heard in the back. You do get a flexible spending debit card. They call it a debit card, but you know it's more like a credit card. You swipe it and you go. Anyways, she wants to know... How long is it good for? Well, the money that you put on it, oh, the card itself is going to be good for three years, number one. Um, you didn't ask this, but I should also mention that with a flexible spending debit card, the money is available for you on day one. So on January 1st for a health care flexible spending account. And this is an advantage for some of you guys. You probably want to know this. If you sign up for, let's say the max stays at $2,550. That's what we're anticipating. That's what it is now. Then on day one, January 1st, New Year's Day, your card is loaded with $2,550 for you to use all at once. Now, some of you in the back might be saying, or up in front might be saying, wait a minute, hold it. I didn't have any money come out. I thought you said the money was going to be deducted over 26 pay periods if I was a 12-month employee and 20 pay periods if I was a 9-month employee. I did, but we are obligated to put the full amount on your card from day one. So that's a good thing. You will have the full max. Dependent care is more like a checking account. The amount that you put in would be the amount that's available. 
And that's what, what happens if I leave the university after the first month? Okay. And I spend all that money. <laughs> you don't really want me to tell them that, do you? Hunch it down, No, 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 no. He's asking a very good question, and he knows. If, the question was, for those of you who didn't hear, I start January 1st, and I leave May, May uh, let's say you, you leave uh, February 1st. So you stay here for a good month. If you didn't incur any expenses, then obviously there's nothing you can use your flexible spending to offset. There's no reimbursement. You lost that first month of premiums. <coughs> if you had expenses, then you would be entitled to be reimbursed for those expenses. And the controversial comment would be up to the full maximum of whatever you set it up for the annual pledge, even if it's 2000 $550. And I can see the dollar signs going in some of your eyes. These are all good questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I decide to put aside $1,000. Yes, ma'am. Would that also be for my husband? That's on my, you know. If you, if you, she's I know calling, what she's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could he use the same card? Does that $1,000 also cover his expenses? It would. Oh, Your husband. one card or two cards? That I was just getting ready to answer that before <laughs> you. I was going to answer that anyway. Yeah. You get two cards. Two cards. Made out to you. Okay. So, and you so, can give your husband a card if he's nice. Okay. <laughs> All right. so, both cards, so both cards would have the amount of 500 or 1000 each. Correct. <laughs> Which, uh, oh, it depends on what you set it up for. If you set it up for... If, say, you, if I say up, up for $1,000... It didn't. Both cards will have $1,000 on it, but the money is going to be deducted as you both use a card. So it's not like you have doubled your money. Okay. So if you use a card and you had maybe $100 come out, now when your husband goes to use a card, he doesn't have $1,000. He has $900 left on the balance. Okay. All right. And do you say that covers the expenses for that we pay for glasses? Because then we go. You know, I did. How do you think I'm wearing these? Okay. So you guys like my glasses? Okay. So, so, so if I know, like yearly, we're spending at least three hundred dollars out of our pockets after insurance for those glasses. That three hundred dollars, I could put, calculate that into my expense. Right, and there is uh, all sorts of worksheets that we can give you. Mm -hmm. Just let us know, or you can go to Discovery Benefits. The only thing that we ask, guys, is that you be very conservative. You know what I mean by that? You be very careful. You don't overestimate. Other than that, you'll be fine. Can I still incur a user charge card after the December 31st? So I still have money left, a few hundred. And if I use those in January or February of the next year, until March. So I have still up to March or April 15th. Right. I want to make sure you guys, Michael has a soft voice today. Normally he doesn't, but today he does. <laughs> Michael asked, okay, I want to make sure I heard you right. It's December 31st, and I still have more expenses to uh, tack on. So this is December 31st of 2016, ideally. So January 1st through March 15th of 2017, I still have some more expenses. I'm going to go shopping. Can I still offset the, whatever balance I have with uh, flexible spending incurred expenses? And the answer would be an absolute positive yes. You could. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a different take on that. Sure. Um, sometimes you set up doctor's appointments or things like, let's say it's January, February, or, you know, basically, and, and you set up a doctor's appointment, but you can't get into March. Did, and did I, or, you know, after March 15th, I lost my benefit? Well, in terms of you not swiping that card or using the, the forms because you didn't incur the expense, yes. You have to incur the expense before or on March 15th, on or, after, uh, on or before March 15th of 2017. So if you have an expense on, I'm just going to uh, just play on that question. So if you incur an expense on March 16th of 2017, it's too late. However, there's always next year to sign up for a flexible spending account. And it starts when, Michael? January what? So, so there's an overlap, isn't there? There's an overlap. I wanted to ask you. There is that overlap. Well, see, I'm anticipating your questions now. Okay. So the only question I really have about that is the yes. money's coming out of our paycheck, yet we're losing it because we didn't use it. I yeah, that, yeah, so I did say that. So what happened? So, I mean, it's coming out of our paycheck, so essentially you're taking back money that we earned. 
We try not to let you. I, I know that. I know that. But, you know, there's certain things that you can plan for and certain things you can't plan for. You can and always you, buy glasses or something like that if, if you need that. <laughs> That's why it's not for everybody why you said be conservative yeah. when you yeah. ask I did, yeah. yeah. You're in total control of the way you Yeah, you're Oh, yeah. Yeah, those are, and Michelle is right. Say that again, Michelle. It's, it's the IRS rules on because it's tax deferred. The uh, IRS yeah. is involved, and they set up a lot of these rules so that in order to have a flex benefit account for the university, they have to be compliant with the IRS rules. So that's if the, if the university could just give us back our money. But then they'd have to be anyway. Never mind. <laughs> All right. So I can flip the page. I was just going to tell you uh, the stuff that we just talked about. So now we can talk about medical stuff. Dennis, where are you? How, many, how much time do I have left? As much time as you need. Oh, wow. um, one of the things, if you look at your schedule, we do have questions at the end. And I know when they're talking about stuff, it's in your head. And you have that question. If you wait five minutes, you're going to forget it. So I think it's great that we do this. Maybe we can kind of like move it along. Because I think there's a ton of information to cover. Um, and I'm sure these individuals will be, will be available after or via email or phone calls or whatever else. Yeah. So definitely maybe you could jot down your questions. We have about a half hour after. I know it's hard to remember them, uh, but yeah, maybe we can try to push on through. Uh, but yeah, keep going. Thanks. All right. Well, this is something that some of you may not be familiar with. And again, this is important because this is open enrollment. What medical plans do what Wayne State University offers? Well, we actually have six plans. One is a traditional plan, and it's Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. We have two PPOs. And the two PPOs would comprise of Community Blue and DMC Care, Detroit Medical Center. Together, they comprise of 17% of all subscribers. I'm sorry, I should have told you that Blue Cross Blue Shield comprise of 3% of all enrollees at Wayne State. And we have the other 80%, if you're doing the math, under one of our three HMOs. We have Health Lions Plant, we have Blue Care Network, and we have Total Health Care. Now, the Blue Cross Blue Shield traditional plan is unique in that there is a requirement of a 100 annual deductible every year. You have to meet that annual deductible before your plan becomes activated. Otherwise, you're just paying it all up in deductibles. The plan does cover you up to 90 to 100 percent uh, for services, for approved services. And I guess you guys are already knew that. And Blue Cross Blue Shield has a very large, very large network of hospitals and doctors. <laughs> that is the big draw to that plan. Community Blue, which is a PPO is unique because a PPO, and the DMC care is also a PPO, but they're unique because they allow you to actually see doctors in the network without having to get a referral. So for those of you that are in an HMO, this is probably something new for you. So it's going to cost typically a little bit more for the two PPOs, but you are allowed to do that. Now, the plan even allows you to go what they consider is out-of-network. Out-of-network simply means that you're seeing a doctor that is not credential, not affiliated with your plan. They're not accepting your coverage as payment in full. They haven't signed up with that plan. So with a PPO, you can actually have some coverage, although it is less coverage than you would typically get with an HMO, but you do have some coverage out-of-network. There are deductibles and co-pays that you would be required to meet. For instance, DMC Care requires that you pay up front, a $500 deductible before you uh, um, before the plan starts paying what it pays in addition to what you're getting in. Community Blue has a $250 deductible. And what they normally pay is 70% for DMC care of what they typically normally, on the average, pay their own docs. And with Community Blue, they will pick up 80% of what they typically normally, on the average, pay their own docs. Now, NADA might be wondering, well, suppose the doctor charges 10 times that, then you would be on the hook for the difference. You would be responsible for the balance. Again, it doesn't cover everything that it does in network. It's not as rich out of network, but you do have that option. The HMOs, Health Alliance Plan, what's unique about that, number one, is right now it's the most popular plan on campus. Over 50% of everyone on campus is enrolled under that one plan. Uh, another unique thing about Health Alliance Plan as an HMO, it actually allows you to see certain specialists within the Henry Ford network without having a referral. So you can see certain specialists, and your primary care physician does not have to sign off on it. So I just wanted to make sure I made that clear. But also let me state this with Health Alliance Plan. It is a pretty big network. And saying that, 
There are providers like Beaumont and Providence and uh, just a number of different... St. Joe's, thank you, that you can also sign up under. They're called the Open Network, and uh, that would, that the um, availability to see a specialist is only for those that are in the Henry Ford Network under Health Alliance Plan, but it's all under the umbrella of HAP. Now, what's unique about Blue Care Network? I think I just said it, Blue. It's part of Blue Cross Blue Shield. It also has a very large network. And then finally, what's unique about Total Health Care? It is the most economical plan that we have to offer. People love the rates. So just be aware that the plan covers everything minus whatever co-pays that you would be normally expected to pay. The, the other thing is life insurance. Some of you probably looked at your emails and you already know what I'm going to say. As of September 1st, you guys, now and I, we all have a new life insurance company, right? It is Sun Life Financial. And uh, they do offer lower group rates, supplemental coverage, premiums have decreased, and provide an overall savings of about 7% for employees. <laughs> the new lower rates went into effect on September 1st and were reflected on your August 26, 2015 paychecks. So I want you guys to be aware of that as well. Again, at Sun Life Financial. And we do have a new uh, pr uh, provider for long-term disability as well. Uh, Wayne State University offers... Oh, I'm sorry, that's Cigna. I didn't mention who that was. I'm jumping ahead. Cigna is the long-term disability provider. Wayne State University also has a vision policy. And under the vision policy, we utilize IMED as our provider. IMED allows you to have a comprehensive eye exam while saving you money on your eye care purchases like eyeglasses, contact lenses, whatever you, you utilize. There are over 7,000 locations. Be aware of that. Small mom and pop locations to JC Penney's and Optimize to, you know, it's just, they're growing almost every day. So it's a really nice plan. What you might not know is that there are two levels of IMED coverage. There is the enhanced coverage that gives you a little bit more bells and whistles, and then there is the basic coverage. For those of you that have 2020 that don't really need to really buy a lot of things for your eyeglasses, the basic would probably be your option. However, if you're like me, and Brett's always reminding me how blind I am, I guess the enhanced would be the best option. He said, I can't see out of a paper bag some days. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be in trouble now. Uh, moving ahead. During our annual open enrollment period, you can enroll under one of these plans. So if you have the basic and you want to uh, bump it up to the enhanced, October 26th through November 6th will be your time to do it. If you have the basic, if you have the enhanced and you want to come down, again, that same pay period would be your time to do it. With regards to your dental plan, uh, it is through Delta Dental, as you probably already know. Uh, you are allowed to see PPO member dentists, premier dentists, and non-participating dentists. That's something that some people may or may not know. And your dental, uh, your what we call your your basic dental coverage, uh, is going to be covered at 90 to 100 percent. That would be for teeth clean, I'm uh, sorry, that would be for root canals, extractions, fillings, and all those other fun things that we like to run and see the dentist for. Teeth cleanings is in a, another level. That's covered at 100% no matter what. And if you were to see non-participating Delta Dental providers or Delta Premier Dentists, it would be covered at 80%. So just be aware of that. Now I'm going to stop here because I can feel more questions coming. So... What do you got for me? Yes, ma'am. You said the insurance, um, uh, the life insurance change. Did the beneficiaries roll over? From yes. The okay. Let me repeat that, though. She said, okay, Wayne State has left the standard. I understand they've gone to, uh, uh, to uh, Sunlight Financial. And I want to know, do I have to fill out another form, or will my beneficiaries just roll over? And I told her that the beneficiaries will roll over. You do not have to fill out another form for that. Very good question. Yes, sir. It's been a few years. Are they going to be opening up another uh, option to increase 
the supplemental by four times or five times? Yes, there will be, and that, and there will be more information to come on that. Okay. Is this for this Could you coming explain? Year? Not everybody's Next aware year. of that, so maybe. You're... I'm sorry. You guys said something at the same time. So not everybody's aware of what that is, so if you want to. Oh well, let me that. repeat that. Ricardo asked. Next year, oh, well, he didn't say when. He says, will there be another opportunity for you guys to bump it up one level? If you have the single or supplemental plus one, can you go up to two without any proof of insurability? Or if you are at two, you want to go up to three. Or if you're at three and you want to go up to four. Four is the max, as you know. Will there be an be a open enrollment period or a special enrollment period to do that since we have a new vendor? And the answer to that was yes. And that would be sometime in 2016. But they want to go from four to five? Brent, go ahead. Let me just amplify that question just in touch. Is that currently, if as an existing employee, you want to increase your life insurance from one to two, three to three, as Albert said, it requires proof of good health. So if you want to increase it, not being, being a mid late entrance, they're going to ask you to fill out a form, and it may or may not approve it. What we're looking to do with this new vendor is in looking at targeting spring of next year, provide this open enrollment or special enrollment, we're going to call it, where you can increase one level without any proof of good health. Does it go beyond four? No. That's four times. I try. <laughs> now, what is yes. on the flip side of that? Yes. If you want to decrease, say I'm at three and I want to go down to two, can you just do that in your time? You have to prove that you are okay. Yes. <laughs> the answer to that is yes, like Brett said. Let me, let me repeat your question so everyone can hear it. She wants to know, can you decrease if you want to drop down a level in life insurance? The answer was yes. If you're at three and you want to go down to two, or if you're at four and you want to go down to three, the answer is yes, you can do that. Okay. It's a good question. Yeah, you can do that any time. As long as you're alive. Oh, okay. I got another question over here. It comes from up front this time. My colleague, my esteemed colleague, wants to know, what does it mean to have one times up to four times supplemental coverage? And I'm glad she asked that. The basic policy is your annual salary, by the way. So everyone in here has at least their annual salary and life insurance premiums that will go to their beneficiaries of your choosing. University paid. University paid, too. Isn't that something? So we can't say it's free. We say it's paying a dime on that. In addition to that, if you decided that wasn't enough, you could pay for one times your annual salary. And Ricardo... By definition, you're still getting the basic and you're paying for one times, so you'll have two times. Likewise, if you were paying for, um, I mean, if you're getting the basic at the university cost and you wanted to pay for four times after your own pocket, in a sense, that's really getting five because you're still getting your basic policy as well. Very good questions. Thank you. Yes? How are things? How are things with the, the information? Do you feel like you need a lot more time? No, I'm, I'm all set if they're set. I okay. Well, just because uh, we have a question, too, um, but maybe after this question, just because it's 1 o'clock and I know some people have to leave by then, I definitely want you guys to hear Michelle's part. That's right. Um, so maybe we can get this one just question. Just it's a real quick question. Are better be quick. <laughs> are the new rates for 2016 available yet? Not yet. Okay. They're coming. That was quick. Good job. Oh. That's quick, isn't it? Yeah, that was super quick. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next time, quick enough. Uh, so, <laughs> everybody, you know, please give Albert a round of applause. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. That's very good information. This is all confusing stuff. Uh, but he'll be here until 1.30, 1 but like I said, we'll give Michelle her due time uh, to talk about leave, another important aspect, and then we'll move on. But Michelle, uh, since 2007, has served as the Executive Director for AAUP, AAFT Local 6075 at Wayne State University. From 96 to 2007, Ms. Fecto worked as a labor educator in Wayne State's Labor Study Center and was a member of the AAUP AFT. I think it was a typo before. Before, becoming, or before coming to Wayne State University, Michelle worked as a union and community organizer with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 951 in Michigan, International Ladies Garment Workers Union at the international offices in New York City, and the Services Employees International Union, Local 79 in Detroit. She's received her formal education from Michigan State University with degrees in employment relations and political science, as well as her master's in labor and industrial relations. Michelle is a birth, foster, and adoptive parent. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of her kids have significant disabilities, including autism, and this has led her to activism on behalf of people with disabilities and to expand on her knowledge of employee rights, of leaves, which she's an expert on, and other protections. She is also an elected member of the Michigan State Board of Education, which, again, is really cool. 
and serves as the board's secretary. Uh, so, Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to, this is pretty self-explanatory, I hope. Um, it, it, it combines information on leave, including the Family Medical Leave Act, um, unpaid leave. This is Article 13, Section A is unpaid leave in our contract. Article 13, Section B is paid professional leaves. Article 13C is leaves of absence with pay, which is what the, the sick leave um, and other types of leaves uh, where the, the leave is taken out of your sick bank or illness bank. And, and D is um, parent um, leave of absence. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I want to just point out some things that were changed in our last contract and also under FMLA. And I'm going to just open it up for questions after that. Um, one of the things is, um, Let's see. Uh, absences covered under FMLA have been expanded. So if you have a family member, uh, a spouse, uh, a child, a parent who's in the military and is, is on deployment or coming back um, and are, is injured and needs care, there's some special leave time that's protected from you to be able to take from work and not have that time be held against you. Um, and I put a website there if you want to learn more about that. Um, I didn't speak too much about that new uh, leave that's available under FMLA right now. Um, so there's, there's unpaid leaves for, pro for professional objectives and reasons. If you want to take an unpaid leave, if you can afford to take an unpaid leave, um, but that has to be mutually agreed upon by both the employer and, the, uh, and you. <laughs> um, there's paid professional leaves that a lot of times academic staff don't, aren't aware of that you have in your contract. Um, again, these have to be um, with, uh, mutually agreed upon by your, your chair and the administration. Um, but if you wanted to take some time off to, um, and this, again, this applies to academic staff and, and faculty. So, this is, so with regard to um, uh, sabbatical, only those with um, tenure, and there's a few academic staff with tenure that this would apply to. Most, most of us do not have tenure. Um, I still include myself as academic staff. Um, I was academic staff. Is, um, ES, it, uh, it doesn't apply if you have ESS. But there are other options that you could take time off. Let's say you're working on your master's or your PhD and you need some time and it's related to your, um, uh, it's particularly if it's related to the work that you do, um, that you could be eligible for, for um, taking some time off with pay. Um, in, uh, including um, days per week um, to, to, to do that. The leaves of absence uh, with pay, um, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people know about these, um, uh, is that you have the short-term disability. But one thing that was changed in the last contract is uh, it used to be that the employer could, and we've had our members, some of our members subject to it, were told that they had to, they were mandatorily forced to leave work, or told that they, and where they could take a medical leave, and then when they come back, they have to go through, uh, get a medical exam by a doctor before they can return. And we've had, we had one case in particular that was horrible. The chair didn't want the guy back, and they were just really, um, they sent him to a doctor who was an absolute quack. And um, it was, I mean, seriously, I think that, that it was under his, uh, under his name and the director of Quack. <laughs> so, and it's also not in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's laws in the, the, America, uh, the Family Medical Leave Act give protections to workers, give you rights to privacy about your medical condition. So the employer can't just say, you have to go to a doctor and we can find out all your medical condition. They can't just ask to see your medical records and say, well, we don't think you, you know, you can work anymore. Um, so the, the contract language was changed to reflect the protections that you have under the Americans with Disabilities Act and under the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, the Family Medical Leave Act applies not only to yourself, but if you're caring for someone and your, um, your child, your spouse, which now includes um, same-sex marriages, thank God, and, um, and your parent. So those, uh, if there's uh, someone in your family that may have a serious health condition, under the, under the law, you might have some rights to time off um, from work and have your job protected because of it. For instance, some people ask me, you know, there's the administration, some administrators, not all, I think they've been trained to really push the FMLA. So when you take a, some sick time, they're going to say, you must apply for FMLA. 
you don't have to apply for FMLA. In, in FMLA, you have to have your doctor fill out a medical certification form. They use a third-party vendor here, which um, Albert referenced before, called FMLA Source, um, which is kind of good in a way because it takes it out of the hands of your uh, immediate supervisors who may make judgments, unfair judgments, based on your medical situation. So most are pretty compassionate, but we have a few that are not. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, under FMLA, you have to fill out this medical form and set up kind of a rigmarole. Under our union contract, you just tell your boss, you know, my child, you know, or, or I'm sick and I need to take some time off. And if the boss asks you for medical verification after five consecutive days of absence, they can ask for that, then you give them a note. So it's a little less burdensome than the uh, FMLA. And under the FMLA, it says if you have rights and benefits that are more beneficial to the employee, that are less intrusive, you go with whatever's better for the employee. Right. So our contract is better than the FMLA. The FMLA is more intrusive than what our contract is. So the law itself, the FMLA law says, you go whatever's best for the employee. And that's in, in the statute. It's not in the regulations. It's actually in the law, which makes it stronger. So... Um, Am I being too, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'm not getting too wonky for you. Um, but in general, I, when I advise people, if you have not gotten uh, ESS yet, and um, and you have a boss who, or maybe maybe your chair is great, or maybe it's somebody in the dean's office who's not so great, that thinks, you know, that, that, that wants to hold these absences against you. One of the things under FMLA is, if you're taking a leave, for instance, to care for your child who might be very sick. I have a son with autism, and um, my husband's boss was very uncompassionate. Uh, mine, mine were always great. And they were um, giving him a really hard time about needing time off to take care of him. Um, and he didn't have tenure yet as a teacher. So in, in that situation, he could use FMLA, and those absences cannot be used against him as a negative factor. They can't be used against you as a negative factor in ESS, in attainment of ESS, in selective salary, in any of that. So if you have someone who, and they also, under FMLA, time off for qualifying reason, it's not, you don't have to get the agreement of your boss, right? You're entitled to it under the law. As long as you qualify, it has to be a serious health condition as defined, and I can always help you figure that out. Um, and in that way, you just have to give notification Go. They can have you fill out a uh, certification. I had to fill out something that my son really was sick and had autism, you know, um, and submit it to the employer. You don't have to put all the particulars of your illness. You just have to put the nature of the condition. So um, the other thing is that uh, there's language about stopping an ESS clock or stopping a tenure clock. If you're having a baby, for instance, or if you are, you know, um, it involves time off because of a child. In, in you can be we change the language to make it clear it's both the father and the mother who would be entitled to this. So as long as you're a significant caregiver of an infant or child, and that means maybe I'm a foster parent, so I've seen it where I might not be the biological parent, but I'm caring for a child, and that child might be ill. It would apply to me. So they call that in loco parentis. So if you are a significant caregiver of a child or infant, and then that person, um, then you can, um, they have to be, um, let's see, under five years old, or under six years old, I'm sorry. Then you can stop your clock and have an extra year. Because, you know, if you don't, if you're ESS track or tenure track and you don't get your ESS in a certain period of time, like by five years, you're fired, right? You're fired. So if you need an extra year because you have complications because of your care for a child, and we also added in a language in there that says if you're caring for your parent with a serious illness, you're caring for your spouse with a serious illness, or you yourself has a serious illness, that would qualify um, to have your clock stopped. So that's some, some new language in there. So I'm going to finish now, and I did pretty good, I think, oh, less than 10 minutes. Yes, Nina. Um, one thing you have to remember if you're a parent, you're a parent of a child, even if you are 90 and your child is 70 and still working. Because I had that when my son needed surgery in Chicago, and my boss told me I couldn't have it under my sick leave policy because the child didn't live with me. My child was like 28 or something like that. 
And I said, it says child. It doesn't say minor child. So just remember if your boss gives you a hassle. Right. Um, and that's actually under our contract. You can see at the bottom of the first page of this handout, immediate family is defined in the contract as spouse, other eligible person, which was like a domestic partner, um, but it, someone, uh, parent, sibling, child, grandparent, parent-in-law, domestic, uh, well, it should be other uh, eligible persons, um, partners, sibling. Uh, so all these people... Um, and other, other persons can also be considered immediate family if they're living in your immediate household. That's our union contract language. So it doesn't say a, a child has to be living with you. But under the FMLA, if the child is older than 18, they have to be incapable of taking care of themselves. And they can ask for ver verification under FMLA. So if your child who's over um, uh, 18 is in a situation where they're having surgery and they can't take care of themselves, then they would be eligible to use FMLA. It, otherwise, um, but they have to, you have to, an extra, there's an extra hitch where you have to show that they're incapable of taking care of themselves. Yeah. So, Michelle, just to pull out, again, the comparison between our contract and FMLA, it's correct to state that there's sometimes when our contract provides superior coverage, sometimes when FMLA, and there's not a quick list, so best to check with yeah, the office you. and know that you, the one thing to remember is you can never be forced by the employer or by your supervisor to take FMLA, but whether or not you choose to do it is sometimes we're better, sometimes they're not. Some, and we've had, I'm, I'm raising this because we'll get members who say, oh, I was told that our contract is always better or I have to use FMLA. It's, yeah. It depends and it really depends. And so getting getting right. advice on your specific situation is our is our advice right. rather than picking a yes or no. That's good. Thank you for saying that. Is that good? <laughs> And I'm always happy to meet with folks because I know sometimes talking about personal situations, you know, you don't want to talk about it openly. So um, I'm always happy to talk and uh, do what I can to uh, answer questions and help you work through uh, if this becomes a situation for you. Okay. And Dennis, I have two questions to you. You want me to respond to those questions now? Yeah, that works. And then we can also open the floor to questions. I also wanted to say... Uh, what our union does, which is really great, is they record this. I don't know if they upload it to YouTube or what, but they, you can view this at any other time if you wanted to. It's just a great resource to have. And just both these individuals are great resources. Uh, really entertaining and very knowledgeable. Thank you. And you look good on video. Thank you. Yeah, you got me eating my lunch on video. It's fascinating. That's the entertaining part. <laughs> but uh, there was an email that was sent to you. We all get a ton of emails and maybe we skim through some of them. Uh, but I was asking for questions. And I don't know if the individuals are here who asked these questions uh, because it was anonymous, but if you do want to add additional information to whatever response that Albert provides, feel free to do so. First question. Are all plans for HAP the same? Or are there levels of HAP, such as a plan where you can go to a healthcare professional that accepts HAP, but not Henry Ford centers? Or does a contract with HAP only covers care at Henry Ford centers? Well, as I indicated before, Health Alliance plan is a lot bigger than just Henry Ford. Um, there's Providence, St. Joe's, uh, William Beaumont. There are just a number of other places that you can go to. So you, if you wanted to find out all the places to go to, the website would be www.hapforhap.org. Very simple. Three words. www.hap.org. Or you could call them at 800 422-4641. Second question. The flexible spending account discovery benefits has asked on several occasions for a diagnostic to pay for benefits. They reported that if the IRS did an audit, they would want to know where um, know that the benefits were paid for uh, services covered. I informed them that the IRS um, does not require diagnostics or th and that HIPAA could be violated by asking for this information. I told them that I would provide location of service, provider name, type of service, of, uh, and where the office visit was. The exam or the procedure was off limits. Now, I further informed them that I would not contact the... Uh, Excuse me, I further informed them that I would contact the IRS 
to see if they were they are requesting the, uh, this information. And then they asked us to respond to this. I sent this to the uh, Discovery Benefits third party administrator. That's what they do. They actually administer the program and adjudicate the claims that you guys get the money back for. This was a response to that question. Good afternoon, Albert. Thank you for your email. And she uh, went on to say, Discovery Benefits does not require a diagnostic. That is incorrect. I've attached a flexible spending frequently asked document that outlines page two of what is required. This includes data service, was received or purchased, made, description of service or item purchased. This is not a diagnosis. A diagnosis. Dollar amount, provider, or store name. And then they wanted to know more about the employee so they could help the employee. So that was the answer to that. And is there any follow-ups to either of those two questions, or did anyone have a different question altogether I, for I either one a, of us? Yes. I have a question. Yes. For myself. No, I'm just kidding. Um, for you. Um, <clears throat> under the prescription <coughs> coverage, you mentioned there are preferred and non-preferred. Um, I've heard of formulary and non-formulary. So I, I'm assuming we are not... That, that somehow preferred and non-preferred are, are different than formulary, non-formulary. No, it's just, it's, it's actually, the it's the same in the sense that anything that's going to cost you $45 is not on the formulary. Right. So it is a non-preferred drug. In fact, they call it the non-preferred. The preferred drug is $20, and it is on the formulary. Okay. But it's a brand name. And we're referring to brand, um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, the insurance company determines they determine. what is. And so right. what, are the, what is the criteria can they, on which they decide what they prefer? I mean, there is, because sometimes, you know, um, you've had members say they've been getting prescriptions and getting it covered, and then all of a sudden it's not covered anymore, and they have to pay the full amount of the prescription drop. Not the $45. Not the $45, but $200 for the script each month. So... Um, and if that happens, we need to know about it because right. that's wrong. They should not be charging you $200. They should be charging you one of the three call pays that we established for you guys. Five for the generic, 20 for the preferred brand name, $45 for the non-preferred brand name. Got it. Okay. So the most that anybody should be paying for a script, no matter what that script did, is $45? There, there are conditions, there are situations where, and I, I know I'm contradicting myself on this, that something was recently brought to my attention. Yeah, yeah. And we're investigating it right now, and we have not gotten to the bottom of it yet. But okay. that's still under investigation. It's okay. looking promising, though. Okay. They said because I got involved, I don't think I had anything to do with it, but I appreciate that. You guys are too nice. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. You need to put you on the spot. No, that's fine. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. As it relates to um, our health insurance and the emergency room visits. Oh, yeah. Well, they're all considered emergencies. It's not that they don't consider, you have to be admitted for it to be considered the type of emergency that they'll waive the $100 deductible uh, copay that you have to be responsible for. So, even though it's, so it's the $100 copay doesn't have any bearing on whether that is emergency. Well, they really consider every visit that you make an emergency. They really do. Uh, with DMC care, they're a little bit more stringent on that. And if you have a Detroit Medical Center or DMC care, they actually will. They have to be admitted. And there's, that's the key. Yeah. They, they, they may actually turn something down for not being emergent and not pay it all together. But the other HMOs and Blue Cross, Blue Shields, and the Community Blue generally will pay it, but they'll attach the $100 deductible because they generally consider everything an emergency. They don't really differentiate between emergent and non-emergent. They just look at how long were you there. But if you have the Detroit Medical Center, they will even deny it for being non-emergent. And then you pay the whole thing. Then you pay the whole thing. So they the MC care. You to urgent care or to make a plan. You can definitely do the urgent care. That's a good point, Ricardo. Thank that's, you. that's what they're trying. That's why they raised the deductible. They're trying to drive people. Oh, I see what to you're urgent saying. Urgent care or to an appointment rather than the emergency room. I, I see what you're saying. It's a disincentive to, to stop in for non emergency Sure, we'll the DMC has no urgent cares in the area. Yeah. Oh. Someone has DMC. <laughs> <laughs> They're over the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good What is the implication regarding the flex plan? Yes. The non-prescription over the counter and the prescription, 
um, medication. Sure. Yeah, that might be that that is also covered. Is that, is that covered? Yeah, let me address that, and then I can get the other part of that. Yeah. Hey, guys, here's a good question on the floor. Some of you guys might want to hear this. If you have a flexible spinning account, and suppose you get a, it's a, it's a prescription, but it's not a, um, it's not an over-the-counter. I mean, it's an over-the-counter script, right? Uh-huh. Or, or even just over-the-counter. Like, like Band-Aids or something like that? Um, like your vitamins. Don't or vitamins or something like that. The only way that the flexible spending account, and this has been changed recently, like within the last two years, the only way that they will cover those items is if your doctor writes you a script for it. Uh, I'll give you an example. It might seem a little bit off the wall, but uh, I don't know. Some of you guys probably know this that are vitamin buffs. Um, vitamin C can cure some uh, illnesses like scurvy. I know you don't get that nowadays. So uh, that's a bad example, but it would have to be something written as a script that actually, for a duration too, that actually is specifically by your doctor. Um, I actually tease people and say you can almost get anything over the counter if your doctor is willing to actually write the script. Now, recently, I've had something added to our website. I haven't even reviewed it to see if it's been posted. I've been told that it was, but we now have a link to... Frequently, um, not frequently asked questions, but items that are actually considered eligible expenses and what they require. So if you go to our website, www.hr.wayne.edu, click on the uh, HR departments and then under uh, benefits, uh, and you go down to flexible spending, you can you should be able to see that today. Oh, so yes, ma'am. Question about the debit card. Is yes. The debit card only is accepted in certain places, what happens if you right. use it, it incorrectly yeah. at well, grocery stores? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, it, accidents happen, and they could inadvertently process something that they should. There are normal safeguards that prevent against that, but the rule is your debit card is accepted at IIAS vendors. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying inventory information system vendors or something like that. So if it's one of those IIAS vendors, like a pharmacy, an established pharmacy, they will know even within the pharmacy if it's a uh, prescription that they're actually covering or a non-prescription. So you can't just buy shoes or some cosmetics at the pharmacy. So they're supposed to be that smart, if you will. But if you do get something that uh, didn't go through the system properly, you can still substantiate it and get it processed and paid. But you do have to get it substantiated. Most scripts are auto-substantiated. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, does, does the flex spending cover the dental? I, I cough, blurred you out. I didn't hear that. The cough, it happened at the exact same time you were talking. Oh, okay. Um, I heard dental. Dental coverage. Does it, if you get on the flex plan, does it cover your dental expenses too? Does the flexible spending cover it? It, it does, but it doesn't cover everything. There are certain things that they will not cover, like um, items that are for... Um, like teeth whitenings or other items that are for um, cosmetic. Cosmetic is the word I was looking for. Thank you so much. It covers braces because I, I did it with my. Well, kids. that's not necessarily cosmetic, but the, it, most people will say right. it. That's actually to correct the bite problem. Right. As you right. can tell with me. <laughs> no, but so, it really works well for my kids getting braces to have that. Yeah, it, it, it does cover that, but if it's cosmetic, thank you very much. It does not cover anything cosmetic. But it will cover all other dental needs that are normally covered under your medical plan. Or some things that are not. Remember, it's not necessarily paired with your medical insurance. But it does not cover anything cosmetic is the answer. And teeth whitening is a thing that comes to mind. I'm sorry, go ahead. For dental, you know, it seems like sometimes for us cosmetic can be relative because the insurance the insurance company may not want to cover. If you pull a teeth and you have a cap to cover that space, then they call that cosmetic and don't, you have to pay for that total out of your pocket. Would that be cosmetic under your definition? No. Something to... <laughs> I see. I can't see, see, see. If, if they pull a teeth, if they yeah. pull a tooth, yeah. and, and are you referring to an implant maybe? Well... Because they don't just put a cap or whatever. 
Yeah, yeah. to cover, you know, a, a so, false tooth more or less to cover. Well, that's an implant. Yes, an implant. And actually, we cover endosteel implants. In your 2015 handbook, on page 17, it actually talks about that right here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, endosteel implants are covered, but if you got something other than that, they, you can use your flexible spending account for that. That's not considered cosmetic. That's okay. considered uh, something that's necessary for biting. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. What about, like, you know, when you get a fill, um, they can do it like your tooth color? Yes, like, the, is that the white composite as opposed to the silver amalgam. Yeah. And so Delta Dental always must. Actually, Delta Dental now has gotten better with that. I don't know if you noticed, but they will pay the difference, and you can use your flexible spending for whatever okay. else that you would have to pay out of pocket. In other words, when you guys go in and get your teeth filled and your dentist wants to use a silver filling, well, that's something that most people nowadays don't want because of the mercury they, people say that you get. I, I don't know, I'm not a dentist. I only play one on TV. But no, seriously. The, uh, you you, you want to make sure that you go ahead and if that's something that you're interested in, the, uh, the amalgam, the, the white filling. Uh, you can use your regular Delta Dental. They're only going to pay the difference of what they would pay towards the silver filling, and your flexible spending would cover any balances that you would have for that. So those are all good. Those are great questions. So what about replacement? So if you have silver fillings, and I They can do it for the replacement. They can take out the silver. In fact, I had that done. Okay. I don't have any more silver now. I used to like jaws. Silver everywhere. It's all I gone. Still, I still do. They're slowly being replaced by crowns. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's what he was wanting to replace all those fillings. The fillings are holding up fine. Heat. Uh, my dentist. Oh, okay. And I wouldn't let him do it because, because I just didn't think it was. It just sounds like money in his pocket to me. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's up to you if you need them done or not. Yeah. I couldn't tell you if it's worth it or not, but your flexible spending will cover it. Very good questions. Yeah, just remember your flexible spending is your, it's still your money. It's, it's still your money. Benefit. That's right. Are we are we all set, everyone? Are we pretty good? Yeah. Again, though, they're always available. Yeah.